Hello students! Today we're going to talk about the short story The Female Body by Margaret Atwood. As you know, we're all going to be reading The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood next week, so this is kind of a fun way to see um, the style of her writing across different pieces, and I think you'll see some similarities when we get to The Handmaid's Tale. So what I've done first is to give you just a little bit of background information about Atwood since we are going to be talking more about her later. Atwood is a Canadian writer, um, but she is, has fame all over the world. She is an outspoken feminist, so a lot of her writing has to do with women struggling against oppression or empowering themselves and that kind of thing. Um, she is firmly set in the postmodern time period, so um, some of the things that um, really epitomize postmodernism are a sense of disillusionment or dissatisfaction, um, uh, kind of a making fun of, or at least including materialism. So you'll see a lot of brand names and disenchantment with the corporate world, a lot of sarcasm, that kind of thing. A lot of her work focuses on retelling myths and fairy tales from a feminist perspective, and we will see some of that in the female body. One of her most famous quotes that really kind of sums up her worldview is this one, men are afraid that women will laugh at them, women are afraid that men will kill them. So this is kind of at the center of a lot of her ideas on gender, is the, the real danger that sexism uh, puts women in, not only emotionally but physically. Uh, just to kind of give you a little overview of the piece, this was written, The Female Body was written when an editor at a magazine sent Margaret Atwood a letter and he said, I know how much you've written about the female body, he said, so I'm hoping that you can write a piece on this topic for our magazine. And that pissed her off, um, that idea that the female body was somehow this monolithic thing um, and that it was a quote unquote topic as opposed to literally being female human people, um, as if the body was somehow separate from the woman. Um, the story also is, again, very postmodern and unusual in terms of its form. So most of the time when we think about short stories, we think about plot, characters, conflict, and this story doesn't really have that. It's written in segmented numbered pieces and doesn't really have a cohesive character all the way through, so very unusual. Again, it hits on those postmodern tropes, disillusionment, materialism, anti-materialism, skepticism, and sarcasm. So what I've done is just given you a tiny breakdown of each slide, and I pulled a quotation, I mean each section, and I pulled a quotation from each section to kind of highlight what that section is about. So the first section is Atwood kind of making fun of this male editor asking her to write about the quote unquote topic of the female body as if it was again an object or somehow separate from the real woman. And so she says, my badly behaved topic, my vulgar topic, my outrageous topic, my aging topic. So think about all these ways that women are, women's bodies are made to be vulgar or outrageous, as if we could help them or control them. Uh, she says, in its oversized coat and winter boots, scuttling along the sidewalk as if it were flesh and blood, hunting for what's out there. So here we have some sarcasm. She's saying, you might almost see my body and think it's a human in there, but of course it isn't, right? It's just a topic. So a very um, snarky uh, sarcastic tone here in the first section. The second section I think is really funny and it's basically just a list um, as if you were buying like a car. Uh, the basic female body comes with the following accessories so it's sort of like you're buying an item and these are all the little things that are included. And the things that are included in the list are all kinds of women's accessories that are meant to make them more beautiful. And some of them, like barrettes or beads, seem pretty innocent. But some of these, like for example, the Mary Widow, are um, things that women have done to make themselves beautiful that actually harmed them. So a Mary Widow is a type of corset. And of course, we have x-rays of women 
uh, from the time period in which those were worn, and we can see that their organs were being compacted and many women died wearing Mary Widows. Uh, and then all the way at the end, she lists out like a peignoir, a flannel nighty, a lace teddy, bed, head. So literally the head is just another accessory, like, like a bracelet that comes with the female body. In the third section, she kind of takes this to another level in terms of the female body being like an object that you can buy. So she says the female body is made up of transparent plastic and lights up when you plug it in. And she goes through all the different systems that are color coded for your convenience. Um, she puts at the end, the reproductive system is optional and can be removed. It comes with, with or without a miniature embryo. Parental judgment can thereby be exercised we do not wish to frighten or offend. So there's this idea that if you don't like the fact that the female body has that power to reproduce, you could have it taken out. Um, because the most important thing is of course not to threaten anyone with that power. Uh, section four is one of my favorites. So section four is kind of different from the other sections. It's a, co a conversation between a husband and wife about their daughter. Uh, and, and they're having kind of a fight about whether to buy the daughter a Barbie doll. Um, so the father is kind of against it, and he says, I won't have one of those things in the house. It gives a young girl a false notion of beauty, not to mention anatomy. If a real woman was built like that, she'd fall on her face. So the father is, you know, kind of a progressive thinking guy, and he doesn't want to do any harm to his daughter by giving her unrealistic beauty standards. And you'd think the mom would agree with him, but the mom knows better. She says, if we don't let her have one like all the other girls, she'll feel singled out. It'll become an issue. She'll long for one, and she'll long to turn into one. Repression breeds sublimation. You know that. So the mom says, if we deny her this, then she'll want it even more. She might even want to become it. So the parents are almost forced by society into letting the daughter have the Barbie. And luckily for the parents, of course, the, the daughter throws the Barbie down the stairs, beheaded, which I think is really funny. Section five is another one of these kind of lists. And this one has a lot to do with how the female body is objectified for money. So uh, I pulled a couple sections here for you. First, uh, Atwood says, it sells cars, beer, shaving lotion, cigarettes, hard liquor. It sells diet plans and diamonds and desire in tiny crystal bottles. Is this the face that launched a thousand products? Now here she is um, kind of, she's quoting uh, uh, Faustus, uh, which is an old play from the Renaissance. And um, they're talking in Faustus about Helen of Troy, who is supposed to be the most beautiful woman in the world, so beautiful that she calls the Trojan War. And the line from Faustus is, is this the face that launched a thousand ships, right? You were so beautiful that a thousand men went to sea for you. And Atwood is making fun of that in a very postmodern way, saying, is this the face that launched a thousand products? Like, now a woman's beauty isn't epic or wonderful, it's really just kind of a bottom line. You bet it is, but don't get any funny big ideas, honey. That smile is a dime a dozen. So, uh, yes, woman, you are powerful in that you can command dollars, but don't get any big ideas that you matter. Uh, we can replace you. There's, there's a million women like you. And then she gets a little bit darker with it and says, it does not merely sell, it is sold. Money flows into this country or that country, flies in, practically crawls in, suitful after suitful. And here she's talking about human trafficking, specifically trafficking young girls. Um, and so you have like wealthy businessmen going to other countries um, specifically to procure these young girls for sex. She says the men are lured by all those hairless preteen legs. Listen, you want to reduce the national debt, don't you? Aren't you patriotic? That's the spirit. That's my girl. So there's this idea that we're manipulating women into selling themselves uh, and making them think that they're doing something good and positive. Section six, um, I pulled here for you an image of The Handmaid's Tale because section six is kind of what The Handmaid's Tale is all about. Um, if you haven't read it yet, it'll make more sense later. But in section six, she's talking about sex versus love. Uh, so she says, this is kind of like a mom talking to her daughter about sex. And she says, one and one equals another one. So it's really just like, where do babies come from? It's just a math problem, honey. 
right? So she talks very specifically about women's biological function. She says pleasure in the female is not a requirement. So uh, there is that kind of hat tip to the idea that uh, to make a baby and for everything biologically to function, um, pleasure in the female isn't, isn't quote unquote necessary. So there's this idea um, among some male scientists, they have this idea that the female orgasm is quote unquote an accident because it doesn't play a role in reproduction. And that's been used um, in kind of a sexist way for a long time. The mom says, we're not talking about love, we're talking about biology. That's how we all got here, daughter. So it's a very reductive um, idea of what a woman's body is for, like it has this job to do and nothing else. And that's very much what The Handmaid's Tale is all about. The final section um, ends with this discussion of why men feel unhappy maybe in the age of feminism and, and why they might feel uncomfortable or even depressed. Um, and so Atwood finishes the whole essay by saying, catch it, put it in a pumpkin in a high tower. So we have these, uh, these images in the beginning here of fairy tales, uh, right? So we have the pumpkin, which is kind of like Cinderella, and then you have the high tower, which is Sleeping Beauty. Uh, or Rapunzel, maybe. And um, young girls are, of course, taught that these things are kind of magical and wonderful. But when we think about them, they're often just another way to kind of trap women to wait to be saved. Um, so those fairy tale images get darker very quickly. Put it in a pumpkin, in a high tower, in a compound, in a chamber, in a house, in a room. Quick, stick a leash on it, a lock, a chain, some pain settle it down so it can never get away from you again. So ultimately, Atwood comes to this conclusion that um, you know, men in many ways have kind of lost control of the female body um, in, in a world where they used to have it all. And so um, it's been difficult for some, for some men to kind of learn to live in this world where women are in control of themselves. Uh, and this all comes back to the editor, of course, who asked her to write about the quote unquote female body, again, as kind of an object um, that could be defined or summed up. So I hope you enjoyed the female body. I know it's kind of a dark essay, but it is also a little bit funny and, and uh, sarcastic. And this really does sum up Margaret Atwood's tone and voice. Of course, as always, you can email me if you have any questions.